do we do we at all want to mention um chicken attack uh, let's save that for the con okay. uh, sounds like a good story anything is a good story it's like a fight club going on <laughs> so I, I i can describe this fairly quickly uh japanese film okay world-class yodeler martial arts and magically creating a chicken ninja from a chicken. <laughs> That's horrible. Or a cow ninja from a cow and a rat ninja from a rat. Or a pig ninja from a pig. Welcome sentient beings from all known universes and beyond. It's time to activate your cranial downlinks and prepare to receive a raft of discussion on a cosmic ocean of science fiction and fantasy topics, interviews with local area genre devotees, and insightful prognostication by our soothsayers of science fiction, our forecasters of fantasy, and any other beings that happen to get caught in our gravity well. This is the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. And welcome to another episode of the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. I'm Bill. I'm Charles. I'm Seth. I'm Jenna. I'm Chris. And we have a special guest on our show tonight, uh, Lucian with the Weekly Geekly. Hey. Uh, one of our, uh, is it a sister or brother podcasts, I guess, on the... Partner. Uh, part, keep it partner. Neutral. There you go. Partner podcast <laughs> on the Synergy Nation Network. So... I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever have I ever come on Galactic. No, no. never, what? never. What? Never. Holy shit! This, We're oh. putting an end to that right now. Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. Every a couple other people is on. Like Devin's always ranting about coming on here. <laughs> um, oh, I want to come back. I'm like, no, my turn. Let me get in. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Right. Happen. Well, and I think it's uh, <clears throat> I think it's great having you on tonight because you're kind of. Uh, um, a horror aficionado, I oh, guess. Oh, to put it I lightly, yeah. It. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. my number lightly. one genre. I love and, it. And uh, why that's important is tonight we're going to be talking about um, a horror movie that I would wager most of our audience is not familiar with. Um, it's called The Empty Man, and uh, it was released um on streaming there's no hard media release for this it's only available on streaming right now it's on hbo max um released in october of 2020 right during the height of the pandemic i think it actually came out in theaters a day right yeah like a special release well um it was so it was uh i think they finished filming it uh in 2018 um and then it was uh, produced by 20th Century Fox. And that was right at the time that Disney was acquiring 20th Century Fox. And uh, uh, so uh, the movie kind of got lost in the shuffle, I guess, and really didn't get much promotion. And uh, some of the executives, I actually watched a, um, an interview today with the director, um, David Pryor. And uh, he said that, uh, once uh, Disney took over, uh, they had demanded a screening uh, of this movie. And he said at the time, so this movie now, it's a, it's a two hour and 17 minute movie. But at the time that they demanded the screening, it was uh, almost a three hour movie. Ooh. And he said, we were in the process of editing it down. Mm. Um, and mm. But they demanded this, this screening. Mm. And he said it really was not in a condition where it was ready for screening. And he said, had I had the experience to know, I would have told them that we're still engaged in principal photography or which we weren't, we'd completed right. that and we were just editing it, but I would have told them that. And I would have sent them a, a 40 minute kind of an overview of the stuff that was really good. But he said, you know, when you tell the studio, okay, um, yeah, I'm going to send you this movie and it's uh, right now it's two hours and 45 minutes. 
the top executives that want to see this movie to make a decision on how they're going to handle it no longer go because they're too busy for a two hour and 45 minute movie. So they pick an underling that they send. And so he said this screening was filled with these pimply faced teenagers, uh, <laughs> which might be a slight over exaggeration on his part, but he said they were pretty young kids and a lot of them didn't get the movie. And he oh, said yeah. the ones that did were really passionate about, it, but they were way outnumbered by the rest of them that just were like, no, this is not um, a movie that's going to go over with the vast majority of audiences. And so they, they gave it kind of a thumbs down and that's what the I think execs the way said. you captured it, Bill last night was really good. When you said you went from a very supportive studio that had, that believed in the vision was giving full creative control to the, to the filmmakers, to a studio that didn't believe in it, didn't understand it, were not willing to give it thoughtful consideration and meaningful support. And they basically burned, they sabotaged it. Right. Uh, they, he said uh, they, they uh, released the trailer for the movie just a week before the movie came out, hit the theaters. Oh. Uh, it was in the theaters for like, I don't know, a day. I mean, not very long because it was in the height of the pandemic. Of course, the box office receipts aren't, aren't doing well because nobody's going. And they thought, well, we're just going to pull it rather than get, you know, reported that this movie did so horribly. Right. Mm -hmm. So they basically yanked it. And, um, and interestingly, um, we, before we watched, uh, so all of us came over and we watched it on the veranda with the exception of Lucian, who wasn't able to make it last night and he hasn't seen the show yet. So yes. we'll kind of Spoiler be playing our, our every man in the audience tonight to ask questions, but we watched before we watched the film, um, Chris Stuckman, um, he has a YouTube channel where he reviews movies and this is how I actually found out about the empty man. Hmm. And in his uh, video, he mentioned that the studio had given him tons of money to make whatever his vision was. Right. But that's not actually accurate. I watched a live review with or a live um, uh, podcast recording with David Pryor this afternoon. And, um, that was kind of the thing as the, the guy asked him, they gave you plenty of money to make this. And he goes, no, he goes, they didn't. Um, and he yeah. said, really? And he said, yeah. So, you know, yeah. if you have like a, a movie, that's going to be a big blockbuster kind of a thing, you can expect um, it to run around a hundred million dollars to make market, get out into the theaters. Right. Um, how much do you suppose they gave him for this movie? 30, 50. I don't was, care. However, he did. He spent it very well. Yeah, I was like, going to say quality movie. fifty, but it's really nice. Yeah, uh, well, sixteen talking, million. Wow, sixteen. Sixteen million for a horror yeah. movie, and it does yes. not look like a sixteen. No, it looks like no. A this was budget. I'm even more impressed now. I'm even wow. more impressed yeah. now. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, that's, I standard couldn't believe for it. Most horror has been like play it cheap. You know, like right, paranormal right. activity was good because it was done really simply and cheap. Evil yeah. Dead, twenty five thousand dollars. You know, like Fair, that's yeah. Crazy yeah. To think about sixteen million dollars. Yes, yes, oh, and, and I mean, it that? looks it is beautifully shot, okay. beautifully framed. It's filmed in uh, an anamorphic uh, uh, filming, so I mean, it's hmm. just kind of an expansive screen uh, when you watch it. Uh, it looks really good. It's well lit in all of the scenes. Um, but yeah, so uh, he said wow. uh, when he was talking about to the studio and they were kind of getting ready to green light this whole thing, um, the studio wanted him to film the whole thing in South Africa because it's so much cheaper. The, the conversion rate for the dollar there is so much better. You can make a movie there for hardly anything. And mm -hmm. they said, you know, go there, check it out. Um, if you're really not happy with it and you don't think you can make the kind of movie you want, we can maybe look at Canada um, yeah. or some other places. Well, so he said he went to South America to scope it out, but he knew that if he came back and told them no, South Africa wasn't going to work because of the scope and the vision of his movie, the amount of money that it would have cost to make it in Canada would have immediately put it onto a back burner and chances are it would have never been made. 
Mm. So he found a way to make South Africa work uh, with the exception of a few scenes that were shot in a neighborhood where they had to do those in Canada. Mm. Um, Well, they also, what about the beginning, the opening sequence? Yeah. So that's supposed to take place in Bhutan. Bhutan. Yeah. Yeah. In uh, 1995. So the thing that is crazy about this movie, Lucian, is that there's an introductory sequence before you get to the main titles and credits oh, cool. for the movie, right? Yeah. That opening sequence is 20 minutes long. It's it's incredible, but it, it is so amazing. It does not feel like you're watching 20 minutes. And you know, the quality of the acting, the shot, uh, the vibe and suspense that it builds, like you're you're brought in. Yeah, yeah, it was like a little mini horror movie before the horror movie. Yeah, it yeah. could have been a standalone horror short, couldn't it? Wow. Yeah, yeah cool. I, exactly. Yeah, it could have been a standalone horror short. Yeah. You never see that, something like that that long. I feel like this movie is taking a lot of different risks that it you normally yeah. see in horror yeah. already. Yeah, yeah it because really is. Like that doesn't really pay off until much much later in the movie almost right. the very end hmm. okay yeah so um uh yeah it's but, it's but that like it's what seth said because it takes so long before that beginning pays off you really have no freaking clue like that was actually what someone last night said like by the time we were an hour into it he's like well, I have no idea where we're going with this, but I can't wait to see. <laughs> right, right, right. And so the, the first 20 minutes takes place in 1995. And then after that, you get the title credit sequence. Um, and then it's uh, 2018 is where the movie picks up. Hmm. And uh, so it kind of ties in um, um, a movie where you've got this secretive cult um, mm-hmm. with um, some tropes that you see in, a, in some horror movies where there's like this um, procedure, these steps you follow that you bring this evil creature into existence or you summon a creature from somewhere. So in this case, um, you have to be on an empty bridge and you find a, 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 bottle, a bottle on the bridge, right? And you blow into this bottle and then you focus in. After intently. dark, of course. Sorry, say that again. After dark, of course. After dark, after of dark. course, right. Yeah. And then you focus intently on the on the empty man. Think of nothing else but the empty man. And then you'll start to hear this tone or this whistle or whatever it is. And that's the sign that, that the summoning has worked. And then um, over the next three days, so day one, um at some point you'll see the is it you'll no, see Bill. at day one you hear him right day yeah. two you see him day three you feel him right mm-hmm. i don't like that no <laughs> yeah that's what you kind of said when they when they said you feel him it was like, Ugh. like i don't want that <laughs> bad touch bad touch yeah, don't touch me there empty man uh, <laughs> but it's yeah. like it's definitely calling upon that urban folklore of like candy man or bloody mary right it's just like that that uh essence of that you call some you can will something by calling it right yeah you have to yeah. stop something i didn't okay Can, yeah candy man is the same kind of thing yeah yeah so i open. think uh, i think at this point we should probably warn the audience that we may be getting into spoiler territory here going yeah we should we should cover the but- plot but yeah, let's kind of cover the prologue, but we should cover the plot. Go ahead. Let's start. not spoil the ending. The no, very I end. agree. I agree. Right. Uh-huh. The ending is really surprising and, and unexpected. So, um, okay. so essentially, it, it really tests the audience to see how hmm. much they've been paying attention. But that's why hmm. the cinematography and the yeah, level yes. of the attention to detail, and he only had $16 million. That's why we're all like, what? <laughs> right. Yeah, so uh, um, so we mentioned that the, the first 20 minutes takes place in Bhutan uh, in 1995, and there's four friends that are out hiking on a mountain. And uh, one of the friends, his name is Paul, uh, he hears a strange whistling calling to him. And so he walks 
towards the sound of the whistling and his friends are like hey where are you going because they don't hear it hmm. and then all of a sudden he falls into a crevasse and he's like gone so they like run over there to the edge trying to figure out where he's at and so one of the friends um greg descends down into the cavern and he finds paul down there in an almost catatonic state um, miraculously and unhurt yeah miraculously yeah. unhurt but he's crying shaking on his knees and he's staring at this massive strange inhuman skeleton embedded into the cave wall really uh, goddamn creepy very creepy yeah and he's got so i don't know fingers. with like 10 fingers on each on hand. locked like this on Ugh. each hand yeah it was at that moment that i would have just turned around and left yeah well <laughs> the thing <laughs> is like he's he's like near catatonic like yeah. kind of meditating in front of this thing yes and his friend is trying to get to him or get him to come Snap around out of it but Snap he, out of it, man. <laughs> but uh when his friend gets close, he whispers to him, if you touch me, you'll die. Right? Yeah, I would leave. I wouldn't even... Nope, sorry, bro. Yeah, any one well, of you, I would just leave in that situation. <laughs> so, Anna, Chris, so I've me... known you guys for near yeah. 20 years now. I would leave you in Bhutan. <laughs> and and right. I wouldn't expect like you. you. You so leave I... my butt there. So as we're watching <laughs> that movie last night, I'm sitting on the sofa and chris is sitting next to me and as soon as the guy gets down into the cave and we see the skeleton chris is like yeah no <laughs> and, and that was like you know uh, every 15 minutes something would happen and chris was like yeah uh, nope yeah Ooh. no yeah that's cool <laughs> yeah no it's great like and i that, said and it looks so good in the movie theater or sorry in the in the screening in the film you're just like oh I believe it. Yeah. I believe yeah. this has been down there a long time. Yeah. I like that it's got almost like uh like spider legs coming off its back. Oh yeah. yeah. Right, right. That's disturbing. Yeah. So apparently this dead thing somehow still has a ghost or a spirit that is able to possess people. Hmm. And it looks for um people that uh, it can possess that they that are termed the empty man because mm. they don't have anything really to overcome. They're easy mm. for him to possess because they're, I guess, empty inside or something. They're uh, transmitters. Yeah. Right. And other people receive. Yes. So, so the guy that gets possessed, like this guy, uh, Paul, that falls into the cave and goes into the catatonic state he becomes a transmitter for this alien um entity mm -hmm. whatever it is interdimensional mm -hmm. i think it'd be safe it's not alien but this is an interdimensional being okay yes and uh so then he becomes a transmitter that then works to recruit these cult members oh god Right. But this is not before uh, no. things go so, horribly wrong for the rest of the people and his friends who try to help him and get him out of the cave. Let me right. guess. They touch him and they die. Yeah, nope. that first guy touched him almost immediately. Oh, what a dummy. And yeah. What do they say? Don't do it. Rolls he down told you not cheek. to touch him. <laughs> right. Literally told you what would happen. <laughs> right. But anyway, he, he touches him and, and he doesn't die and they uh, yes. eventually All get out. <laughs> uh, right they get ropes around him and they haul him out of the thing and then they the guys carry him trying to carry him out of the valley and mm -hmm. they've got to cross this gigantic chasm spanning chain bridge oh. and so they cross that thing and I, how he walked across that thing carrying a body i don't know he but does anyway, cross they, it i told you <laughs> yeah. yeah so they get across they find this abandoned house like structure it's in Bhutan, right? So it's not like a you know traditional house you would see here in America, but it's it's a home. And mm -hmm. so they go in and and they lay him on the floor, and he's still in a catatonic state. And uh, it starts snowing, kind of a snowstorm, blizzard type thing moving in. So they don't want to go out and go anywhere. So they got to spend the night there. And um, he's in the catatonic state all night. And so Jenna, I'll let you kind of take over from there and describe the next steps. So. Obviously, they're couples. It wasn't so apparent at the beginning, but 
So this guy's catatonic. His girlfriend's freaking out. Um, you kind of get a little hint of a backstory that maybe he's been suicidal in the past. He's mm-hmm. not complete. Like he's got a lot of baggage going on in his life. Right. Um, and so his his guy friend, who's known him like twenty years, and his girlfriend, they're like, "We're just gonna stay calm. We're gonna stay here. We'll try and go down the mountain tomorrow. Get it sorted." So uh, they end up finding in his hand, they'll grip this whistle. So his, bone whistle. Yeah. That's, made out of not just bone. a whistle made out of bone. Yeah. Like and the tops and ends of it are kind of wrapped with animal hide. Something but like the, that. Yeah. But, yeah. But it's like a whistle. Yeah. So, you know, they're each in one side of the shack and the, the girlfriend of the catatonic guy, Paul, uh, just starts blowing it. Like, you know, because obviously like you she's would, never you seen a goddamn horror movie in her life. Um, <laughs> None of these people and, are living by the code. <laughs> right. No, they are not living by the code, apparently. So, um, yeah, so then that's the end. Day one, day two. The, the couple that are still alive and well, they try and go down the mountain. And she thinks, uh, so while the girlfriend is there, while looking after her, her man, trying to make sure he don't die, uh, she she thinks she sees somebody outside and runs out there to ask for help. And it's a hooded, cloaked figure that's slowly getting closer. It's, it's and, rapidly and, getting closer. And yeah, and you can see her spider sense is tingling and she's <laughs> like, nope, and well, runs back inside. Here was the creepy part, right? Was she takes a step forward and it took a step back. She takes a step forward again. It takes a step back. Then she took a step backwards. And that's when it started taking a step towards her. It Ooh. took 10 steps forward with that Yeah, it took like 10 back. steps forward. Yeah. And <laughs> that's key because, again, we, we call out this director's ability to put moments like that later on in the movie. It, we'll, we'll come up to that again later. But, but this oh, okay. scene of taking a step forward and taking a step back does come back again later. Hmm. And I want to say a creepy, uh, scary way. And I want to yeah. save that that later scene that you're talking about, Chris, for you to describe for us. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that was that's, was... that's the point where the actor uh, in the film voices everything, the same phrase Chris had been saying every 15 minutes. Where he's, yeah, the no, actor's yes. looking at what's happening and he goes, yeah, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he catches up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'll he, let Chris describe that for it. Yeah, we'll anyway. get back to that because that was yeah. my favorite scene yes. out of the whole movie. So, yeah. right, anyways, good. I wanted to call that out. Sorry, Jim. Yep. No yeah, good. so she runs back inside, um, slams the door shut just before the hooded figure gets there, and then it's her friends. And we're all in an audience like, oh, it's probably not her friends. Don't open the door. And they're like, girl, right. let us in. And she lets them in, and it is her friends. And she's like, did you see him? And they're like, no, we only saw you. Why are you tripping? Mm. So uh, we go into night, the second night. They still can't go down the mountain. They're just trying to survive. At one point, we see everyone's asleep in the cabin, and we hear whispers. And we get this flash of Paul, who's been comatose all this time, awake, whispering in her ear. Yeah, this weird, yeah. like, oh, yeah, God. Like it's That's like a chirping. clicking a clicking yeah. whisper like the aliens from signs yeah just, yeah just like bit. right and, over her ear kind of like insect like yeah, yeah at first it almost looked like he was like levitating above her but he was just well guys you know, and the way this scene was shot again it's very wide it's very it's very immersive yeah. in the way that it's shot so you're engaged you're right there and you almost don't want to be you're almost too close right <laughs> um is yeah, that how you do foreplay weird <laughs> <laughs> So, so she wakes up. So everybody wakes up and they're like, where's Paul? Mm-hmm. I don't know. He what WTF, mate. So they <laughs> follow the footsteps out, like trying to find good old Paul. And they see him sitting cross-legged in front of the bridge, blowing. Oh, Paul, no. No, no, not at all, Paul. And like his girlfriend kind of hangs back and his his male buddy who kind of hinted that there's some issues with Paul is like, no, like, come on, you're being an asshole. Let's go. I'm tired of your drama. I'm tired of your shit. Thinking yeah. you're so special. And uh, we kind of get whispers again. And the next thing we know that the girlfriend of Paul seems to kind of freak out. And let's just say she walks his over buddy, to Greg. Yeah, Greg doesn't last long, neither does his girlfriend, and a really quick, unexpected 
gruesome way Damage, because Damage, she Damage. had kept a knife and then she quickly follows them into yay netherworld we don't want to spoil it completely but you're all we know is then that paul was left alone still at the bridge in the winter who blowing and transmitting and that's the prologue that's the prologue that's then you the get to prologue the <laughs> yes. so so it, yeah for for an intro it was very much engaging already kind of set the tone creepy as hell mm. um i mean it sucked me right in though i was I was ready. Let's do this. I'm I'm ready to like cringe and turn away from the screen. Let's do this. Uh, but then it kind of, you know, we mentioned that the, you know, an interesting pace and it seemed kind of slow initially. I mean, it started out good, yeah. and then it just kind of resets, right? Mm. It's like it it just cuts everything off and then starts anew. Kind of starts new with a slow burn. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So here, the second part of the movie. If you're familiar with kind of the the Lovecraft mythos and the the story or the Call of Cthulhu, that that story, okay, it is very much reminiscent of that, mm-hmm. and I think that was kind, it was kind of calling back to that and that uh, genre of uh, cosmic horror, in that we start back up with an investigator. In 2018. In 2018. Yeah, and... so this guy's a former detective, and his name is James La Sombra. But anyway, go ahead, Seth. Yeah, and so uh, we quickly, we meet him. He's celebrating his birthday alone. Uh, he's kind of depressed and alone. And uh, really quick, we kind of meet this neighbor's daughter, who's really weird and is talking about only things that you can think are real. Nothing nothing else is real. She's and... talking about their tragic past. She's like, you know, I can tell things haven't been the same. Mom's the same. We never see you anymore. I mean, it was really weird. It's like your wife and son died so closely after my dad died, and we're all heartbroken. So we're getting this kind of quick. There's an there's a, a former, there's like definitely a... a a mentoring relationship that he's had over the daughter, some weird distance between her, him and her mom for whatever reason. And there's tragedy. Like we get tragedy. And then she disappears. Uh, the girl's mom calls him and he goes and they find in her room written in blood, the empty man made me do it. Ooh. And in Lovecraftian fashion, he like since he is a uh, he's an ex uh, detective, he begins investigating, looking for her, and he starts off with her friends, and her friends are uh, weird. Uh, he only actually meets one of them, but he she tells him a story. That's Devara. Yeah, Devara. Oh tells him a story about the last time they saw uh, they were together with the girl he's looking for. That's Amanda. Amanda. So Amanda and them are all out on the bridge and she tells them about an urban legend about the empty man. So if you find a bottle on a bridge. She's definitely an instigator. Yeah. (laughs) You blow on the you blow you whistle through the bottle and you think about the empty man. And then on the first night, you hear him. The second night, you see him. The third night, you feel him. And they kind of, this whole gang of teenagers is on the bridge, and they all blow on the bottle. They all think about the empty man. And so then it kicks back to present day, and she's already seeing the empty man. Mm. So she sees it. And you see the other like kids from the gang all doing that exact same meditation pose that we saw Mm -hmm. the character in the first part of the film doing against the wall of the school watching her talk to the investigator and they all use the head same head movement thing it's like they all turn and they look at you Uh, yeah come with us yeah yeah basically so so he goes to the bridge that uh she told him about and he 
finds the same bottle that they blew on and he blows on it for I don't Never know reasons. why. Yeah. Not only is it a dirty bottle, but uh, on a bridge that you heard about with an urban legend, but don't put it to your lips and don't just don't put it to your lips. I think right. it's depending on the UV light has killed the bacteria. You <laughs> gross. <laughs> it's good uh, for the immune system. But yeah, so he finds the bridge and then he continues his investigation and he finds he's looking into the empty man and this what is the institute called bill uh the uh, pro upon uh, pontifex institute the pontifex institute yeah. <clears throat> and so he begins investigating those things and then he slowly figures out that that is like a cult that worships the empty man oh, and not before unfortunately finding five of those kids, because originally there were seven, including Amanda on the bridge, five of them hang themselves under the bridge. Ooh, the finds time. those. And, and then, then poor Devara, who had been like, nope, I don't want to, y'all crazy. I've seen the horror movie. She knew the rules, but she bowed the peer pressure. Mm. And then she goes to the spa to try and calm her dits. And unfortunately, uh, the empty man appears. And the next thing we know, she's stabbing herself multiple times in the, in the eye, face. Face. through the yes. eye. Ooh, I like that. Was it yeah. good? Was it like it a good? good? It was good. Yeah, it, it was intense, was... unexpected. Yeah. It was super creepy. Yeah, yes. that kind of reminds me of like a uh, hereditary, where the mom saw her own head off. Yeah. No, don't say anymore. Bill's got to see hereditary. Yeah, yeah. Bill hasn't seen her. No hereditary <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> okay, really yeah, and and I and... know it won't ruin it for you, but that kind of like drastic, vivid, just. Yeah, well, what yeah. I think what makes this more um, horrifying is that you see this shadowy, so this empty man, and you really don't see a face or anything. It's just like covered in these rags, uh, yeah. dark mm -hmm. black rags. Um, this this shadowy figure, and so it comes up to her, grabs her by the throat, holds her up off of her feet against the wall and then pulls out these scissors and begins stabbing her in the face. Ooh. And then what happens is halfway through that, it cuts and you see there's no empty man there. She's holding herself up against the wall and stabbing herself in the face with the scissors. Uh, and then she was... if she's dead. There's then... still something there that closes her eyes and writes the empty man next to the body. Uh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And... Uh, and then uh, we go back to uh, the uh, our main character finds out about this from the police and also finds out that this has been happening all over the place. Yeah. These horrible murders with the empty man made me do it or the empty man written next right. to it. And the police are kind of like, you know how how do we how do we investigate something like this it's beyond our ability to yeah you can't you can't investigate the divine or something along right. those lines or the, the divine says. or the profane or whatever yeah. well, and he, you mostly so just have to let it go you can see this they're kind of drawing on the social what do they call it social contagion which is a real phenomenon in psychology so it's kind of like when there's a suicide in a high school, there's suddenly a bunch more uh, suicides because of the the notoriety that first student gets. Having like a suicide pact going on. Not even a suicide pact. It's it's an emotional, like people jump on the emotional bag, bandwagon. Mm. Um, same with mass shootings, kind of like where one kid does the mass shooting and then other copycat mass shootings. Like people are... Yep. It's so they're the the they're they're looping in without explicitly saying the concept of social contagion, mm. and and then how do you fight that when you have people jumping on these emotional bandwagons? I think is where the cop was going. Mm. So um, you know he just keeps going after this cult, trying to figure out because each of these students that when he investigated their rooms and and tried to figure out more information, they had like something snippet from the Pontifex uh, Institute or, and then it turns out into Pontifex Society and he goes to this building and it's obviously a lot of money. You definitely get Scientology vibes. Mm. Oh, yeah, get, yeah, like anti-authoritarian. Yep. He gets anti into the system. 
Yeah, he gets into the the lobby, and there's this perfectly done up blonde girl there, very, very pretty, very, very happy to see him. And Robot. she's like, "Welcome back." And you're you're muted, Bill. Sorry, it was almost like a Stepford Wives moment. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, and he's like, I've never been here. And she's like, oh, okay, here, fill this out. And it's this informational sheet, name, address, whatever. And then a list of check boxes that's like the world is is due for a cleansing. Uh, nothing is real. I... Norms should be broken uh, to, to be like, norms should be broken for the point of breaking them. Like things that the brain can itch. Hmm. Um, yeah, just all kinds of weird shit that you like <laughs> you <know>. yeah beliefs <laughs> and, yeah. and then he uh ten he like follows a group into a kind of a sermon mm. held by held by one of these guys who and that the sermon's just full crazy lots of the same kind of stuff he explicitly mentions the empty man he mm. he mentions the empty man yeah, the uh, sermon's uh, given by uh, Stephen uh, Root was the uh, Root. yeah was yep. the uh, did a good job too yeah. yeah super creepy he was like yeah. the preacher or whatever of the empty man empty man cult and after the sermon he they have it he actually talks to the guy right. or talks talks to the preacher and he sits down with him and is once again says i'm so glad you came back and he's like i've never been here before uh but can you explain the empty man to me i love that and yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah and he kind of ex he, he explains this philosophical concept of uh repeating your if if you repeat your name just like over and over and over again it eventually becomes gibberish so which is more true your name or the gibberish hmm. and that is the empty man that <laughs> knowledge that fa fades due to repetition or uh becomes knowledge that just does not or is destroyed so something like i i need to watch it another three times to actually so, get my head around but, what but he's his, talking his about. His spiel was seemingly like really intelligent. It, yes. it didn't. It wasn't nonsense to a degree. Right. Um, and uh, that that was kind of the trippy part about it was he didn't he didn't really answer him and maybe the way that he thought he probably uh, he left with more questions after talking to that guy than, than right. he had answers really. But I think I said really last leave. night. I I think I said last night I wanted to memorize that whole section that that guy said so that I can use it whenever I get in a conversation with somebody I want to get away from. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that, that's it's, definitely one of those conversations. You, yeah, memorize right. it for that. Because I won't ever have like, to worry about that person. Myself coming, out. Yeah, I won't so ever have like, to worry about that person coming up and talking to me again. The just, the just of it, like I think the, the best way that I got out of interpreting it that is you just go through the motions and you repeat an action without fully consider it, or you repeat words without fully saying it over and over and over again you're just passing through them they're not really impactful and the example he gave was when you stare at the abyss the abyss stares back and you say you've heard we've all heard it a thousand times what does it really mean but when you stop and you give something attention and you give it focus and you really delve into what is this thing it becomes more substantial, more real, more um, uh, give more life to impactful the back on you. Yeah. Hmm. So he ends up wandering around some more, finds creepier and creepier shit, like a bunker with a bunch of bald guys in there meditating on a black poster that he's seen in the other kids' rooms. And then he sees a circle group that appears to be trying to summon something through focus and reach out to an entity, but he gets busted and thrown out into an alley where some other kid he saw there earlier uh, and had asked him, have you seen Amanda is like, Hey dude, you're never going to get, find out anything that way. This is like a pretty powerful group and Amanda's working her way up. So if you really want to know more about it, you should go check out this camp elsewhere. Hmm. 
Like he try he buddies up to the main character, like he's trying to help him. Kind of sus, but you know, at this point, yeah. the lead character is like so mind fucked at this point. Like, what the hell is going on? He gets uh, in his car and goes to this camp hoping to find Amanda. So let's turn it over to Chris at this point because this is mm. going to lead right into Chris's se- favorite section. So, well, yeah. So um, he eventually makes his way to going to this uh it was at this campground i forget the name of the camp Camp elsewhere elsewhere camp elsewhere gets in there to do some investigating and uh there's actually a couple of creepy things we should talk about here yeah Uh, and one has to do with a teddy bear (laughs) um so he's he's poking around in these cabins and, and one of them's got uh, interestingly enough, it's got a, uh, he breaks into this file cabinet as he's doing his investigation, and uh, he comes across uh, the names of uh, the people he was looking for, the kids. Like a it, dossier and, on each yeah, of the missing of people. Each one of them, like a full-on dossier of names, addresses, pictures, their life, uh, pretty much everything about them. And then he also comes across a folder with his own name on there. But there's nothing in it. But there's nothing in it. It's an empty folder. Waiting to uh, build. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, what right. fucker is this? Yeah. <laughs> so he, he starts investigating uh, a little bit more and then stumbles across a, uh, a, a back room. Now, again, we talked about the director's ability to kind of to kind of paint this full picture in a room mm-hmm. and, and have details in there. So as you're walking by, there's this torn up stuffed teddy bear on the ground. Big brown teddy bear thing um it's like okay he moves on gets to this back room uh finds some videotapes right of um uh i forget what they were numbered what they were called um meditation like the, 13. Mani- yeah. manifestation manifestation yeah yep. so manifestations with different numbers on it so he puts a tape and starts playing it and um you see where these people seemingly become taken over by some kind of entity or, or possessed or whatever and ultimately, as they're researching this person, there's a scene in there where this guy basically um, rips out his own guts, okay, and starts to paint this picture on the wall with his own blood and guts. Yeah. Um, while it's doing that, it's it's showing different shots in the room, and it turns out he's in the room where that happened. He looks to the right, and that's there. But again, pay attention to the larger shots that he's doing. And, and at least like three or four shots where it's going back and forth it has a teddy bear there until it doesn't. Right. <laughs> uh, and that was that was one of the, and we were all waiting for it. And I was like, oh man, that teddy bear's got to be in that shot for some reason. And it kept going back and forth and it's still there and it's still there and then it's gone. Um, and and so he doesn't really he he takes note of it, but then he kind of moves on. Like it's like it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and we're just, mm, I'm not sure I would have. It was like another that. yeah, no moment for Chris. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a yeah, no, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> so he continues to uh, do his investigation, starts walking around a bit more, and eventually he he uh, makes his way through this forest area and comes across a, uh, a a gathering, if you will, around a massive bonfire. Okay, and in this gathering, I got a photo of uh, it here. Yeah, and I, and let me just jump in here real quick. Yep. According to the director, they had a cast of two hundred people hmm. uh, do this. And um, <clears throat> just to give a little a little um, background before Chris continues the description, um, he uh, the inspiration for this this section came from watching uh, videos of. Uh, these uh, whirling dervishes that um, do these uh, coordinated, highly choreographed, coordinated movements, a uh, bunch of them all together doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. And um, he wanted to duplicate that with these cult members where they're all doing the exact same movements uh, synchronized as they run at a fairly high clip around this gigantic bonfire. So, uh, so he did that with 200 because he said, you know, it's pretty impossible to find a large enough group of whirling dervishes in South Africa where this, <laughs> where this show was filmed. So, uh, but uh, they did an amazing job. So anyway, go ahead, Chris. They, they did. And that explains the creepiness of what, what I'm about to get into. So he, he sneaks up on this, right? So 
from where he's at, he's kind of a little bit across a stream, uh, kind of coming out of these, emerging out of these woods. And he sees this, this grouping going on here and they're running around in a circle uh, and this massive bonfire and it, and it looks crazy, right? And then uh, it kind of does this pan up to the sky and it looks like the fire is shooting up to the sky or whatever. And then uh, kind of as he looks down again, uh, at one point the fire just is gone, just stops. And oh, it's dead silent and they're just standing there. Looking at him. Looking oh, at no. Him. Well, he's not sure. Okay. It looks like it. Quite at first. Yeah. Because the way they're doing the lighting, it's like you can't really tell. Are they looking at me? You know? Right. Yeah. They're that a, yeah. That was a yeah, no moment for me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and and so what he does is he takes a step back. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. And as Bill pointed out, in unison, this whole group takes a step forward. You can kind of hear it like a march step, right? Um, and uh, so then he takes another step. And then they take another march step. And that is when him and I, I feel like connected in the movie. All of us. His, <laughs> his words verbatim were, yeah, no. Okay? <laughs> And this right. is when he seems to catch up with what a normal human being would do, right. which is to turn around and get your ass out of there. Right. Probably like an hour too so, late. Okay. Yeah. Now, now it's too late. So he he turns around and he starts running. And now it's almost like a zombie apocalypse chasing scene oh. going on. And he's oh. got this massive group of people running after him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, hold on, to, hold that picture there for a minute. Let me just throw a little something else in here. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> the director said that one of the things that they were doing. So this uh, area that they're at um, is, is almost like an island because they filmed it in this area that uh, when, it, when it gets wet in the rainy season, it kind of isolates this, these little land areas. And I mean, the water's not deep. You can walk through mm -hmm. it and it might be like chest deep water or whatever. Um, and the, the different land areas are connected <clears throat> with these very narrow wood bridges and we see this our our hero walking across one of these bridges very narrow no railings on either side just these reeds growing up and you don't know what's if anything's hiding in the weeds waiting to get you it's very creepy mm -hmm. and <clears throat> but he crosses and he's on a <clears throat> section of land that's separated from the section of land where these uh, cultists are and this big bonfire is and so in your mind you think okay well if he has to turn and get out of there at least it will take these guys a while to make it through the water to get to his side of the land right right, right. um and the director said what they did to make this um creepy was that they built a metal platform just underneath the water so that all these cultists come down to the water and they appear to run right across the top oh of it. my god that's so over to where he me out. is yes yep. and that so detail, said, they didn't spend a lot of time on the scene no it goes so but fast looking at it yeah you realize you weren't dealing with normal people yeah. right i mean also adding to the creepiness is like look how well like the area is lit yeah. yeah, but you can't see any of their faces. They are yeah. all kind of shadow people. That's crazy. Yeah. So, so you anyway, get the, uh, the, mad, the whole unified, like, this is one body. These are not individuals. Yeah. Right. So Ooh. go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so um, I, I don't have too much more to add here. Obviously, he cuts tail and runs and uh, makes it to his, uh, his Jeep in just the time as you can bet. And, uh, you know, gets in there and manages to get away. Um, now, he gets back to, uh, if I'm re if you're recollecting the, the timeline of events here, gets back to uh, his, his home eventually. And uh, as he's uh, going to sleep, uh, is, is awoken uh, in the middle of the night uh, by a noise. Oh, no. And, and uh, um, is sure enough. Because too. Yeah, this so this this begins the end of day two. Yeah. yeah. And uh um when he goes to check on, on what that noise is, he also had a very good reaction, which was uh, you know, he, he's looking down his hallway, which I would never live in a place that your master bedroom, like as soon as you open the door, you're looking right out to your front <laughs> door. 
Oh, no. Um, but he's looking at the end of his entryway, and there's this figure there. Um, the kind of a little bit above the steps or whatever. And then it pops up and it's the it's the empty man and he's coming for him. He slams the door shut, uh, you know, does a barrel roll or something uh, <laughs> backwards. Actually, uh, he keeps a baseball bat uh, in his bedroom and, uh, you know, he gets it and, and he's ready to fight. Um, and then uh, if, I, if I recall, it just goes away or something of that nature. But, but it's worse through and then it's gone. Yeah, then then it's gone. Um, but his then... front door is still open. Right. So he goes to check the front door because the front door is now open or whatever. So he goes to check it, and sitting in the front door is the teddy bear. <laughs> right. That, okay. Oh no. Now, nope. Burn now it. it gets worse. Let me ask you, Lucian, what would you do with that teddy bear? Burn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't touch okay. it. Okay. We you all had the same reaction. Survey says you burn. It. That, burn it. Fire cleanses all. That you pour gasoline on it and bear, you burn it where you find it. Puts it up in his arms like this is mine now. He's got his bat in his hand and goes back to bed. Oh my god! He takes it, it in the house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for someone that said, "Oh hell no!" like three times. Yeah. Right. Not really showing that skill at yeah. the end there, bud. No. I would have shut the front door, went to the garage, found some gasoline, went back out there, oh, yeah. that sucker, and light it. <laughs> right. <laughs> So no, he trash can outside, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, this and this is actually a really good tense moment. I think we mm -hmm. can leave our audience because if we're not going to spoil the end of the movie, right, right, like yeah. this is where the, the director is like the pace of the movie has now more than met the pace of the prologue. Yeah. The lead, he has a lead on the girl, but he has no idea. It sounds like she's actually an instigator and a part like deep into all of this. Oh, wow. He's mm -hmm. got to find out what's going on because obviously they're watching him too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they know who he is now. They know where he lives. And he's like, there's going to have to be a resolution because her mom, the, the girl's mom is in danger. And, and all of us, none of us know where this is going to go from here because right. It's one part, you know it's a cult and it's very human, but you have this other paranormal element and you don't know which is ultimately going to win out. Yep. Which is yeah. where the tension is beautifully done. In this that movie. sounds really well done, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we haven't really heard much from Charles yet. Uh, uh, Charles, <laughs> did, was there any part that you wanted to call out specifically? That yeah, it's, been fun. it's been fun listening to you because I watched this on my own. Yeah. And so I went back and forth... Um, uh, between being really impressed and really pissed off. <laughs> Why pissed off? Well, well, because well, I I lose the plot. Because was it about the this demon possessing people, or was it about some some cult, or was I, I all of the above? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, yeah, was, there were a, little... a lot of different themes that were explored throughout this whole thing. And, and without I mean, spoiling the ending, that's what it was kind of unraveling. It was Yeah, 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 but I, I yeah. In, in my impatience, <laughs> no, I'm like, no, I, I, slasher, I want to know it's a slasher. If it's paranormal, I want to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, Get that. Um, so, so that would, but um, I will say it's, well, it's a, yeah, the, the, it's a pretty movie. And actually, the soundtrack was quite relaxing. I, I did have some problems. Too, <laughs> Charles actually got new uh, falling asleep music. From <laughs> Went down and uh, actually, for, for a whole yeah. soundtrack. If you're sleeping to that, you might want to see someone. <laughs> yeah. No, I think right. if you go back and listen to it, it's not, there's not a whole lot of the um, interruptions, you know. The, well, see, the, I think the problem is, Charles, is that you were watching the movie with your eyes closed. <laughs> no, was, yeah. no no <laughs> um and the dialogue's good yeah especially yeah. with the breach there's there's a lot of places where the the, the the dialogue's great it doesn't again doesn't solve anything for you which i i i, I have to say i found i found frustrating but and i you know the you bring out a point there which i kind of want to make but very carefully because i don't want to throw away the surprise ending of the film but as you're watching the film one of the clues there is some of the things that the hero our character in the film this uh um uh, sheriff uh james lasombra that's the character's name mm -hmm. um will repeat will repeat a couple yeah. of things 
uh, a series of things. And you're thinking, you know, about the third or fourth time you hear him say some of these things over again, you're like, yeah, dude, we get it. We understand. Yeah. You know, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, but then yeah. at the end, you realize you're like, why? oh, fuck. Now I understand why. Uh, that part, the, the, that the, part was a mind fuck. But yes, yes. right, right. So. so it's definitely worth picking up. It's really sad that, you know, obviously a lot of love and a lot of detail is put into this movie. Yeah. And some yeah. asshole who was only caring about dollar signs, like, didn't give it the proper investment. It's like at that point, if you're acquiring a studio, <laughs> there's a lot of talent put into a film. It's like, why not give it the full advertising that it deserves? Yeah. Yeah, what happens? And, you, and I, if you shit on it, and you know it's not going to do well. Well, yeah. And and this is a, a little interesting uh, aside too. Uh, uh, David Pryor mentioned in this video that I watched uh, today that you know that twenty minute opening. It when he originally scripted it, it was nowhere near twenty minutes. Hmm. But this executive at the studio that was fully twentieth uh, century Fox, it was fully supportive of his vision and getting this whole thing produced told him that he needed to make that he should make that opening segment longer and more detailed uh, because he had more that he could do with it. And he kind of explained to him, but he wanted to keep it down because it was just so, you know, opposite of what, what you normally do in a movie that you have this 20 minute intro is just unheard of. But this executive said, no, I want you to do it. And he said, okay, well realize that if I do this, you're not going to be able to cut it and go back because this thing, I will write it in such a way that you have to have it the full yeah. 20 minutes you, or it won't make sense. Right. And so he did that and that's what the executive wanted. But then about the time he finishes making the film, this executive at the 20th Century Fox left the studio and went somewhere else. And so he lost his primary supporter. And then of course, right about that time is when Disney took over and then everything changed even worse and they got a, a whole different group in. And, but by then it was too late. He already had this 20 minute intro. And um, he said uh, the studio execs, um, they screened it before a test audience and uh, the test audience, I don't know who they got, but um, it didn't get rave reviews. Um, and so the executive said, okay, we're going to edit this thing down to 90 minutes. And uh, so they did that. They edited it down to 90 minutes and then they rescreened it for another test audience. And then the reviews just hit rock bottom. And they said, wow. okay, fine. Fuck it. Leave it at two hours and 17 minutes, whatever <laughs> it, it's done. And uh, so but... I, I would have liked, this is a movie I would like to see an extended cut, like the full mm, yeah. three hours or something like that, because, because I've seen what they can do with the time that they had. Yeah. Uh, even after cutting and I was very much impressed. So I'd like to know what other work they did with the cameras, the scenery, the dialogue, uh, yeah. what other lore they could have tossed in there. Uh, maybe there's uh, some more investigative stuff, but if they had an extended one, I'd be, I'd even pay for it. it yeah. Exactly. Well, and I, we would say too that there's people in our group when we watched it that are not horror movie people. They don't like horror movies and they liked this movie because mm-hmm. it wasn't, a graphic scare it was definitely a lot of suspense there was definitely terror at times don't get me wrong but there were no well, jump scares which i thought right. was it nice. wasn't yeah this wasn't a horror movie that was things that jump out to get you no, there's, a little, there's, a, there's a little gore but not a not, little gore very not not, not excessive much. yeah tastefully not. done yeah <laughs> that's good Fine. like very classy gore right yes. but it was classy. more this psychological terror kind of a thing right <laughs> Yeah, um, it like, really was because you just don't know what the fuck. Like you, the tropes only get you into the movie by relating it to the folklore of like a Bloody Mary or, or yeah. a Candyman. But then afterward, you have no fucking clue. Yeah, I like that though. I, that's the the unknown is the scariest. Yes, yeah. and, and that I mean, it probably a lot of the lore behind this script is that for as many different details and tropes that they're bringing into this script and packing it really full, you still don't know a lot. No, because no. right. I mean, you told me up until probably the last third of the movie so far. Yeah, and I st- I'm still like I have no idea where that would go. Right, you know what I mean? right. Yeah, yeah and you, you have won't. to watch it and report back to us. Oh, I totally will. Yeah, like the rest of our audience too. They need to report back to us what you thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. You know, and and I, again, I'll do a little five minute intro or in, in, in whatever. <laughs> you can talk yeah. about something else too. 
<laughs> and another little uh, uh, side note too is that uh, David Pryor mentioned that um, <clears throat> this uh, executive at 20th Century Fox that was mm-hmm. you know in favor of this movie, they were planning to make this um, an intellectual property type of um, entry into the horror genre for them. They really didn't have um, a thematic property like other studios had for horror. Yeah. And so the, the intention was, is that this was kind of a kickoff movie and that there would be a number of sequels made to it. And he said, oh. you know, of course that's out the window at this point based well, on its you performance. Never know, you never know, <clears throat> but yeah, but it is, it is starting to become, uh, uh, there is, it is developing a cult following now. On that's the internet, say, so. Yeah. Time will tell because yeah, there's many horror movies that flopped originally, yeah. and then when they got on streaming five, ten years later, everyone's in love with it. Now they're making sequels and reboots. And I yeah. mean, like, look he said, at- uh, he said it's the kind of film that, um, uh, he said he can see in a few years that this will be a mandatory showing at horror cons. Ooh, I, I like that. Comedy. Yeah, I can see that. And, yeah. and you know, we, we're living in a day and age where. Um, we don't have to wait for someone to pick us up to go to big screen either. Right. And HBO Max has it. HBO Max might get the feedback and be like, hey, we're going to take this and run with it. We, we've seen uh, yeah. um, these these other movies that are suspense that you'd otherwise see on the big screen go direct to uh, mm-hmm. some kind of series on on streaming. So HBO, Netflix, Hulu, somebody may pick it up because that's, that's just the day and age we're in right now. So I'm optimistic it, w- it could happen even sooner than that, depending on the, the cult following. Yeah, so the more and you we know, talk about it, the more we have chances of that happening. Yeah, one of the things that I came across was a, a comment um, – uh, oh, I think it was Roger Ebert or whatever, because he reviewed it. And he mentioned okay. that um, this movie, after watching this movie, he could have easily envisioned this as this this entire movie being a Netflix series, yep. a first season of a Netflix yep. series. There was that much content in it, and it had that much... Uh, detail that it could have easily been an entire series they did great world building for sure yeah yeah, yeah. and and you see that a lot with some of the series now and instead of like a two-hour event you have 10 12 hour you know series yeah. of uh this this plot that builds suspensefully in every episode that gets people coming back this easily could be that or uh like you mentioned the initial idea could have been having this as some kind of ip where it's now a franchise and, right. and there's always there's a movie that comes out every two or three years of another story in that world uh, covering that. There was just so much left on the table here. Yeah, because um, like where story. you know where did that where did that alien or that multidimensional creature come from? How right. did he end up being in that cave? You can I mean, go backwards or forwards here. You can yeah, do whatever you want. There was so much left to the imagination there that there was just a lot of content that could be developed into other shows. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, even the last. 10 or 15 minutes of that would have been a great season finale yeah you know yeah exactly that would have been an awesome season finale oh yeah definitely so so wow i really need to check this out yes it was it was good i was surprised bill that was an excellent excellent find yeah it was i'm glad you guys liked it you never know because i hadn't seen it before i watched it fresh with you guys (laughs) you know all i had seen was that uh Chris Stedman um, review of the movie. And uh, he just, uh, you know, piqued my interest enough from that, that I thought, you know what, this would be a good one for us to talk about, especially mm-hmm. in the September, October timeframe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We are so, getting gra- back into creepy season. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, Lucian, you'll have to check with uh, uh, Benito. Benito Garcia is a, a friend of the show. He's been on a number of times and he watched it yesterday. And um, I asked him what he thought of it. And he said, he said, have you watched it yet? And I said, well, we're watching it tonight. And he's like, oh, that's right. He goes, well, I don't want to, I don't want to color your perceptions by letting you know what I thought. So I haven't talked to him yet, but I'm imagining imagining he probably (laughs) really enjoyed it. What's that? He did not like it. He did not? He literally said, who the fuck do I talk to about getting two and a half hours of my life back? Are you oh, kidding me? Oh, yeah. Weird. Oh my God. You also have to understand, Benito is from the... Um, yeah. 
from the school of thought, which, which is more slasher based. Yeah, oh, he's a graphic okay. guy. Goal. Yeah, I don't know, but I there were there were moments in this where I was waiting for Scarlett Johansson to jump out of a box. <laughs> <laughs> for those Definitely that not haven't, if Disney bought that studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For those that uh, don't know what Charles talking about, he's referencing a, a movie called Under the Skin with Scarlett Johansson that is. Uh, very horror creepy as well and it's just uh awful. really it's just awful <laughs> <laughs> i don't think you can call any movie that gives us that much nude scarlet johansson awful it may right. not be the best but it's not there's there that that in itself will elevate it to give right. it some value yeah. <laughs> now, I now i liked under the skin and benito loved it okay which is different because it wasn't really a slasher movie at all either yeah but huh. so anyway, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to talk to him. Yeah, well, you'll have to get his opinion, see what right. he didn't like about it, you know? Right, I'll reach out to him, so. Uh, right, yeah, well, I was kind of nervous when he said that. I was like, oh, maybe this is going to be bad. I don't want to, <laughs> but the way you guys describe this really kind of gets under my skin. Right. I really ah, want to I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's you have right. to watch it, let us know what you there. think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll check it out. As well as our audience. Let us know right. what you think and definitely leave comments. Yep. We hope you like it as well as we did. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Check it out on HBO Max once again. Right. And uh, be sure to check us out on galacticdriftwood.space where you can find all of our other podcasts that we've done on different shows. Um, and be sure to check out our um, partner podcasters on Synergy Nation, synnation.net, where you can watch shows like The Weekly Geekly with Lucian. Um, and a lot of other really good podcasts out there. So uh, anyway, thanks for tuning in for another episode. We'll see you again next time. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. Adios. Bye. Bye. It's day three. You will feel me. <laughs> <laughs> Lower. I, I felt someone grab my ass. What the hell? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs>